Technically, I'm a professional storyteller. Between the documentaries, this podcast, and getting to go on stage around the world, I tell stories to people. I try to be respectful of privacy, personal requests, and just not embarrassing folks. But every storyteller has a few special baubles that they keep away for special occasions, especially when they're not recorded, just for a few folks lucky enough to be around for them. I'm going to tell you three of them, heavily anonymized, and yet, I hope, still entertaining. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. My friend was famous. People knew his name around the world. He was trying to get away from all that, moving to a more private life, living a life more based around learning and exploring and a lot less about being in the public eye. In the years hence, he's moved out of my state, found a whole new life, and frankly, I'm very, very happy for him. There was one moment when I was going to see him, even then somewhat rare, and he asked me for a pretty minor favor. He was getting a package from the post office, and it was going to be heavy, and maybe I could help him lift it to where it needed to go. Since any time with him was precious, and I knew it was going to be coming to an end, I agreed immediately. We met on the streets of the city, talked a while, and went to the post office, where a very large package was waiting for him. It was bulky and weird, and frankly we should have used some sort of taxi. We dissembled it and put it into a smaller bag. It turned out to be a piece of metal that was assembled using several pieces, and I didn't quite understand what it was, but he explained it to me as we went. If you have a really good motorcycle, I mean a really good one, you start to care about the strangest things. You care about the paint job being clean, you care about the engine being perfectly well-tuned, and in some cases, you care about the inflation of the tires. Enough that, when your bike is parked, you don't want the tire to just sit in one place. It'll start to flatten, just a little bit, and you'll notice it in the ride. I'm trusting that this is all true, it's certainly what I was told. What we were picking up was a special kickstand for a motorcycle, enabling the rear wheel to be held off the ground so the tire would never have to touch the ground when it was parked. We were going to install it on his special motorcycle. It's weird to have a motorcycle in the city, and it's even more weird to have one that you're not comfortable parking anywhere. You can't park it in your apartment if it's a walk-up, so you're probably talking some sort of paid parking located in the city. We walked along with this metal contraption and made our way down an unnamed street that in every way seemed just all residential. There wasn't any garage there. There was nowhere to put this. But he assured me we were on the right street. We walked up to an apartment that had a regular door. But he didn't knock. He used a key and let himself into a place where you couldn't open the second door until the first door was closed. Everything on the outside looked like any other apartment you'd see on any street. Once we went through the second door, though, I found out we were not in a regular apartment. Inside were what could only be described as millions of dollars worth of motorcycles. Each one was parked in a row up the middle of what was actually a garage. Every motorcycle had its own little closet wardrobe that was full of tools and spare parts, and there were multiple rooms. We'd walk down one, go through a few sliding doors, and end up with rooms with even more motorcycles. His was parked around this small maze of fantastically beautiful luxury motorcycles, and then we proceeded to try to install this kickstand, allowing the bike to never let its rear wheel touch the base earth. As it turns out, we had the wrong kickstand. It took us 45 minutes to figure this out, but I'll save you the time and say we couldn't get the kickstand installed. It turned out that my friend didn't just have a nice bike. He had a bike that he had imported from Italy. 
There were only six of them in the United States that he knew about, and so the kickstand company had naturally assumed that he had the North American version. The kickstand would never get on. You would have had to saw things away to make it work. But during those 45 minutes, I couldn't help asking a little bit about this mysterious place full of all of these bikes. It was a family-run business. They lived on the second floor, and there were cameras everywhere. It was a hidden, secluded motorcycle garage. It had several rules. Obviously, you couldn't tell anybody where it was. And you absolutely could not start your motorcycle inside the garage, outside the building, or even on the street. You were expected to wheel it out down the street and then start it up. The location of that street was right near a highway on-ramp, which meant that you could be out of the city, out of the state, and traveling on your beautiful luxury motorcycle in minutes. I was fascinated. How many of these secret places are around cities? How many secret clubs, secret endeavors are being run behind what are innocuous-looking buildings with stairs and doors and security you'll never be aware of, doing things you can never find? How much of that is going on? I'm really grateful to my friend that he unintentionally reminded me that life is full of mystery, that the surface is not what it seems, and that you can buy a motorcycle too exclusive for a kickstand. The best stories I ever got from the BBS documentary always started with the same phrase, could you turn off the camera? You'd get people going, they'd remember the old days, and then inevitably they'd remember something really juicy, really gossipy, and they didn't want it on the record, but they saw in me an ear of somebody who would understand what was being talked about. So they couldn't resist telling it, at least once. One such story got told to me by a guy who I just loved interviewing. He's gone now, and I'm sad we didn't talk much after the interview. But during the time that we did this, he was just fantastic, really gave perspective to what he knew about, and he knew everybody. Somewhere halfway through the interview, he turned to me and said, could you turn off the camera? I'd like to tell you something. With every corner shaved off, here's what he told me. There was a prominent person who was running gatherings, meetings, and they were very important to the industry that his meetings were for. Folks lined up to be a part of them. They were the place to be, and there were multiple ones running every year. The organizer was brilliant, insightful, always had something interesting and thoughtful to say. But he also had a temper, and he was very, very petty. At one point, a journalist wrote a review about something that was important to this organizer, and he didn't like it. The journalist found out how much he didn't like it when he sent in his payment for a ticket to the next gathering. It came back in the mail, returned. He called up the organizer and said, What's going on here? My ticket was returned. And the organizer explained to him directly, Oh, you're not coming anymore. Not when you write reviews like that. Now, this wasn't a particularly mean review. It had been a standard, less than positive one. And the journalist said to the organizer, You can't do this. This is my job. I need to go to this. There's no reason for me to be barred from it. And the organizer said, Your money isn't good here, and it never will be. Months and months later, this organizer ran another event in another country. It was, like all of his others, well attended, very popular, and very well run. He knew how to do this. But at the event, he had a very tall, very beautiful companion. The two of them were inseparable for the whole event. And, well, he was married. 
the event went off without a hitch. Another successful triumph for this organizer. And then, very shortly thereafter, the fax machine started to go off in his office. The fax machine went off in several offices. And the fax machine at his home, which nobody was supposed to have the number of, also went off. And all of these messages showed the same thing. Picture after picture after picture of him and his very tall, very beautiful companion. So I guess the lesson here is don't get between a journalist and his career. And don't make a person whose job is to do research and know a lot of things feel like you're not giving them anywhere to turn. Finally, here's a story I can tell you with a few more details about who's involved. It took place at Infocom. Circumstances put me in possession of some of Infocom's internal communications. There was a lot there that doesn't need to be public, but I can say that there was one situation that only made sense in the expansion of time, and which still, to this day, makes me so happy. Being a young company, Infocom had a lot of low-paid or no-paid summer interns. Kids, really, whose friends or family knew that there was this fun company with a huge reputation, and that if kids could come in in the summer, they could test games as free quality assurance labor. We're talking kids 13, 14, 15, connected to terminals in the Infocom offices in 1983 and 1984, who would play the games, report what bugs they found, and then be given new chances to try the games out after the bugs were fixed. All of these kids are being corralled by several managers, none of whom I'll name. They all had different styles of keeping the kids in line. Remember, these are kids just walking into the Infocom office, going off to a corner, and then playing games all day. Quality assurance sounds like a lot of fun until you actually do it. Something about the messages between one of the managers and one specific kid really got my attention. He was doing testing on Steve Moretzky's Planetfall, Steve Moretzky's first big game, the game that would catapult him to game designer rock star status. Uh, and this kid was getting the brunt. His manager was convinced that he wasn't using his time properly. This manager was time tracking this kid to hell. Remember, he's not being paid. He's just some sort of tester. But the manager would tell him when he was five minutes idle that he had taken a little bit too long to type the next thing. The manager would tell him when his bathroom breaks were inappropriate, or that even though he was playing games after hours, as was totally allowed, maybe this kid could cut back on that because it was a sure sign that they might start slacking off. I mean, this was just bad management all the way around. No way to treat a kid who's giving his time to work on these games. It may sound like it's just fun, but it's not. It is absolutely a tough job involving looking at a list of bugs, testing them out, returning what they are, and then moving on to the next one. And here it was decades later, and I felt so bad for this kid. While everybody else played Zork and Planet Fall and Suspended and had such a great time, deep in the minds of Infocom was this kid getting totally hit from every side by this manager being told that they weren't going to get the job done, and I thought that was so unfair. But I was curious as to what happened to that kid, and here's what happened. Steve Moretzky went on to make a glorious set of games. He made Planetfall, Stationfall, co-wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Leather Goddesses of Phobos. After Infocom, he went to work for Legend Entertainment, the Sorcerer series, later games like Hodge and Podge, the Space Bar, many classics, many of them still well regarded today. And it had culminated in the 1990s with a company called Bafo Games that he had co-founded with a few other Infocom people. But the games industry by the 90s was an even tougher business than it had ever been before. 
and Bafo Games had closed. Steve found himself out of work. So he had spread the word among his contacts that he was looking for the next phase of his career. And as luck would have it, a company came forward and the CEO made Steve Moretzky the head of design. A glorious triumph for Steve and a company he worked at for years, being involved in a number of series and providing his well-earned expertise to make the games better. And this is where I'll tell you that the CEO of this company that gave Steve Moretzky a leg up was that kid, the playtester for Planetfall, who had been criticized for taking too many minutes between keystrokes and playing a few too many games. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Forrest Fuqua, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt.